get to see everybody here. Um, it's nice to be able to get to see old friends and colleagues again. against us, it also burns the grass in my yard. Um, so, um, as you can see, I work in what's called the Risk Solutions Department. If I was standing here working for Zurich, then that would be the Risk Engineering Department. Um, if I was standing here working for RSA, uh, that would be the Risk Consulting Department. And if I was standing here working for Aviva, it would be the Risk Management Department. In QB, it's the risk solutions, but I think most of you probably know um, the area I work in is the risk engineering team, so insurance risk engineering. So who are QBE? Um, well, they were formed um, originally in 1886, um, so they're about two years younger than uh, the love of my life. Uh, and no, I'm not married to a very old woman. Um, I'm talking about Derby County Football Club. Um, they, QB itself was formed um, in, um, in the early 70s, uh, but it's been around for 150 odd years, something like that. Um, we employ around 12,000 people, 28 countries, uh, providing insurance in around 180 countries. Three divisions within QBE, so it's not all about QBE, but I've just got to do the little bit about QBE, um, just to give some context of where, where I sit uh, and, and, and my team. Um, so yeah, QBE Insurance Group, three divisions, uh, OSPAC, which is at, at where our head office is quartered, um, and also we provide domestic insurance as well as commercial insurance in Aust Australia and the Pacific area. So we're a bit of a household name there, but in Europe and North America, in our international divisions, it's just corporate and commercial insurance. Um, so I sit in the European Operations uh, Division working for the, in the UK team. And in the UK, uh, we provide annual insurance or involved in the annual insurances of around 20 out of the top 30 tier one constru uh, construction companies and, and a significant number of the top 150 tier two construction companies. So we are a prominent construction insurance provider. Um, which sort of gives us uh, a little bit of, 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 of authority to speak today. We're certainly not here representing the insurance sector. We're here representing QBE and our opinions of uh, how we see the JCOP uh, and its changes, etc. Um, so in terms of risk solutions, um, Henry Ford once said that a customer could have any car they want, provided it was black. Um, and I would say the traditional risk engineering proposition from the insurance sector is that a customer can have um, any risk management proposition they want as long as it's a survey. Well, within QBE, we try and do a little bit more than that. We try and um, instill support and collaboration uh, and working in partnership with our insured clients and none more so than with the Fire JCOP. We've held um, sort of seminars with individual clients and, and, and talking shops. We've got a Hot Works forum next week um, with a lot number of our tier one contractors to get them talking together about the, the challenges. Um, so in some ways, um, um, Andy, Ray uh, and Matt have set it up very nicely for me. They've essentially scared the bejesus out of you, uh, which gives me a little bit of comfort as to why, um, you know, why, why the JCOP's so important. Um, and I also know that uh, Mark uh, from Waits this morning talked a little bit about contrasting and comparing uh, HSG 168 and the JCOP. Um, and the fundamental difference is that, of course, HSG 168 is all about life safety the JCOP is about life safety because obviously we ensure liability exposures and, and they can be impacted by fires. But the JCOP primarily is about property protection uh, and protecting the building under construction from fire. And hence goes a little bit more, uh, a little bit further than 168. Now, once, uh, once people are out of the building, then sort of 168 to all intents and purposes has done its job. What the JCOP tries to do is ensure that the, the fire is mitigated as far as possible. So 
So what is the J-COP? Uh, you can see it's full title there. Um, in talking to clients about the J-COP, it, 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 it's quite apparent that there's this perception that there's been a complete lack of consultation. I mean, I'm not here defending the J-COP um, or, or taking any responsibility for its production. Um, we're just sharing our view of it. You know, we're stuck with it as much as, uh, as, much as the construction sector. Um, but it was produced by the, the FPA uh, and, and Risk Authority. Um, yes, the Association of British Insurers were involved in its development, as was the London Fire Brigade. But most importantly, uh, the Contractors Legal Group were one of the contributors. And that was made up of Build UK, uh, the National Build uh, Federation of Builders, the Scottish Building Federation, um, the National uh, Access and Scaffolding uh, Confederation, and it was also received endorsement from uh, Seeker, Cyreg, it's a construction industry, risk engineering group, it's probably the one you don't know, um, the Institute of Civil Engineers, REBA and RICS. So it has gone through consultation phases and it has received endorsement. It isn't just the insurance sector producing standards without consultation and in isolation. And it was established, uh, I should say, um, it was first issued in 1992. This isn't new. This has been around for 31 years. Uh, the previous edition, edition 9, was published in 2016 and so has been embedded uh, for several years before the latest iteration. Um, but it was established in 1992 following a major fire in 1991 quite ironically during the construction of the London Underwriting Centre. So the insurance sector itself took a pre pretty significant hit um, during the construction of a major um, insurance building. Um, and there was maybe a reaction to that um, in, in, in order to generate the, the JCOP itself. So what does the uh, JCOP apply to? Um, well, it applies to activities carried out prior to and during the procurement, the construction and the design process. So it isn't just about once uh, tools are on site, it's all about the design and the procurement process. Um, doesn't apply to the operational aspects of the building per se, but obviously if during the operation of a building there's refurbishment works um, and additional construction works, then the JCOP will be attracted uh, to those operations again. Um, Primarily it applies, applies to um, contracts with an initial project value of over two and a half million pounds, um, but applies equally to smaller parts of a major construction uh, of a large project, and a large project is defined as anything over 20 million pounds. Our sort of stance in general terms though is that it's good general advice and best working practice and should therefore apply to all contracts. If you're applying it to your major contracts, to anything over two and a half million pounds, then sort of why wouldn't you to all of your contracts where, 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 where reasonable and feasible, of course. Obviously, we get asked a lot about the status of the JCOP, and, it, and it's fairly complex. In fact, in some ways, it's got more teeth through contractual arrangements than it has through your insurance contract. So your insurance contracts will refer to compliance with the JCOP, but it isn't what's called a condition precedent. So it doesn't mean you have to comply in order for us to pay your claims. So it's not a condition of a policy. What is a condition of a policy is that the insurer will reserve the right to visit uh, and to uh, audit and inspect against the code of practice and if there are significant breaches which can't be resolved, then ultimately we have the sanction to pull cover with 30 days notice. Now, I've been in this game 20, 25 years, the insurance risk management game, and I'm not aware of insurance cover being pulled for non-compliance with the JCOP. It's not a healthy relationship for the insurer to have with their insured clients. So we'll always try and and I'm talking QBE, we'll always try and work to find a, 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 a reasonable solution, etc. But it is worth pointing out that, for instance, the JCT uh, Building Design 2016 form of contract does refer to all parties complying with the JCOP. And so in some ways, compliance with the JCOP is probably more onerous through your contractual arrangements than it is through your insurance policy. 
So that's really worth pointing out and, and, and worth noting. Some of the terms used within the JCOP um, resemble health and safety wording and health and safety joint code of practice, uh, code of practice, approved code of practice wording, sorry. Um, so it says that where the word must um, is used, the procedure to which it's comply, uh, to a, a, the procedure to which it applies is compulsory. So there's very little, um, very little sort of wiggle room, if you like, when it uses the word must. Where the word shall is used, um, then again, this indicates that it's mandatory. So I'm not quite sure what the difference is between compulsory and mandatory, but it does qualify the mandatory requirement with except where compliance is impractical. Now again, in health and safety language, practicability is about physical possibility. There's no reasonable about it. It's where it's physically impossible to comply with the JCOP. Um, then you are entitled to look at it on a risk assessment basis. Where the word should is used, then that is essentially best practice. So it's important that when you're looking at the various clauses within the JCOP, you look at whether it uses the word must, shall or should, because they have slightly different connotations and slightly different authority, if you like. So... Obviously, I took you back to 1991 and the uh, fire at the Underwriting Centre, which was the main catalyst for the first JCOP 31 years ago. Um, but it is still important today. And it's still important today. Sorry, that's not particularly clear. So it's very clear here, if you want to just gather around. Um, the, the, um, you know, there are big three, the main big three losses that we have uh, with insurance, uh, sorry, with construction works insurance are, are collapse. Obviously, they're significant and, and, and costly. Of course, fire is in there. An interesting, Ray talked about um, water damage being one of the big three um, in, in the US, and it's, it's the same here as well. As well as flood, inundation, etc. We're talking um, water damage, escape of water as, as one of the major losses. Um, and, and if you talk to your insurers, you'll know that they're, as well as banging on about the JCOP, they'll also be banging on about the CIREG, uh, escape of water document as well so so they are the big three so it is still relevant to us today um, even 31 years after the first JCOP so yeah it's been around 31 years the latest edition or the previous edition sorry has been around for several years and yet this edition has caused more angst anger frustration um, any other descriptive word or emotion you want to elicit actually scrap that because we've not heard things like joy and happiness associated with it. But any negative connotation, any negative emotion has been associated with this latest version. So why is that? You know, why, after 31 years of the JCOP, has this latest edition um, caused so much angst? Well, one theory um, is the prohibition of deep fat fryers. Uh, we've gone one stage further than the US uh, and actually banned deep fat fryers. Now, of course, you know, putting your well-being hat on, you'd probably say, well, of course, that's a good thing. Um, I mean, I remember in, in my early days as an HSE inspector trampsing around uh, a high-profile civil engineering company who are still around today and are actually a QBE-insured client, um, where their breakfast consisted of steak and chips as well as the usual English fry-up. Um, and that was still prevalent up until 10, 15 years ago. Uh, my colleague Ryan went to see them recently and, and reported that they're not still doing steak and chips for breakfast, which is good because obviously that's JCOP compliant and that's what we want to see. But it isn't that really. I think it's possibly around hot works. There's been a lot of significant changes around hot works. Um, and I'm sure Mark this morning mentioned the alignment in terms of the fire watch period. Uh, and again, contrast that to what Ray had to say about the US and, and you can see we have gone a long way. We'll come back to that. So yeah, there has been a lot of noise, a lot of consultation, a lot of questions, um, a, 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 a lot of angst around the latest JCOP like we've never seen. Book your tickets now for the 8th International Tall Building High Rise Fire Safety Conference, taking place alongside FDIC in Indianapolis, US, on the 15th to the 17th of April, 2024. 
Three days of world-class speaker presentations, debates and networking. Book your tickets via the website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com. Early bird discount tickets will be available. The Tall and High Rise Building Fire Safety Management course is ideal for anyone who has responsibility for fire safety management in tall and high rise buildings. It is a five day intensive course with world class instructors. You can get full details of the course on our website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com So I want to just share some of the main changes and our perception of those main changes. So the bad news is that from the 9th edition to the 10.1 edition, as I should have mentioned, the first 10th edition was August, and then it was pulled and then re-released in, in January with some, uh, with some minor amendments. In fact, well, one or two significant ones, which I'll mention. Uh, but between the 9th edition and the 10.1 edition, there are 54 amendments. So that's the bad news. The good news is I'm going to, only going to focus on 16 of them. 13 generic ones that I think have relevance to high-rise construction. Um, but three in particular which have specific application to high-rise construction. So some of the, the general ones, um, the requirement around fire planning, always been there of course, uh, but now it recognises that the fire plan has to develop uh, and recognise the change in risk profile during the uh, construction process. Um, in terms of fire systems, there's a bit of an alignment here with property insurance requirements, so operational property insurance requirements, that where you have partial occupation, um, then you have to have formal impairment systems if the fire uh, alarm and, and detection systems are, are being impaired. So it's formalising those impairment processes where there is partial occupation uh, during construction. Um, temporary coverings, again this is one that we're wrestling with just as much as the uh, construction sector is wrestling with because it now extends to hardboards uh, which must comply and, and meet class A2 and, and the other little bits. As far as we're concerned and as far as our insured clients are telling us, they don't exist. There are no hardboards that comply to those standards. So there's a bit of a requirement that actually can't be fulfilled. So it seems. Uh, a requirement around fire extinguishers um, that basically putting the onus upon the principal contractor to take ownership of all fire extinguishers brought onto site uh, by all subcontractors. And that's challenging. We recognise that's challenging. But also to take ownership uh, and overall responsibility for the fire uh, competence and, and training around fire extinguishers, etc. Again, Ray talked about the importance of site security, and that's no different within the UK. Arson is still one of the major causes of, uh, of fire and, and fire loss. Um, and so, again, the recent JCOP has beefed up the requirements around site security, talking about um, all being licensed by the uh, SIA um, and, 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 and work for ACS um, um, approved, approved businesses. So again, just beefing up the site security requirements. Beefing up the CCTV requirements as well, certainly around high fire risk sites, so timber frame, high fire load uh, sites, etc., cetera, um, where um, you should consider um, activated remote monitoring of your CCTV to, a, uh, to an appropriate centre, etc. Um, and or permanent security. So it's, it's beefing up those security uh, requirements. So our marketing team done a great job in making it look great, but the writing's so blooming small for somebody of my age. And I'm like, <laughs> and I don't want to turn my back to you. Is that blurred? It's not great, is it? I feel a memo coming on. So um, again, some of the main changes around temporary buildings. So temporary buildings, temporary accommodation, there is a difference. 
Um, again, we use them interchangeably, but actually if you look at the definitions, temporary buildings are your traditional site cabins, independent buildings, etc. Temporary accommodation is site cabins within the site under construction, so a converted room um, or a room being dedicated for site accommodation or site accommodation within the actual, say, building under construction. So there are differences. Um, I should have said at the start, there's a fundamental precursor to all that, all this that I'm saying, and that is that you are intimately familiar with all the standards within um, um, the, the ninth edition. And then I'm just talking about the differences. <clears throat> Perhaps a bit of a, a wild assumption, but you know, there is an assumption there. Well, the ninth edition um, was fairly prescriptive around um, site buildings and temporary site buildings. And the original 10th edition back in August brought in higher standards. What the 10.1 edition has done has deferred introduction of those enhanced standards to temporary buildings until January 2025. There was a significant supply chain issue where um, site cabins to that specification just weren't available in, this, in the required numbers to fulfil the requirement. So um, they have pushed back that requirement uh, back to 2025. Basic requirement is that there should be a minimum of six metre separation from the building under construction between your temporary buildings and the site under construction. Or if you can't maintain the six metres, then there should be no um, accommodation within six metres if you're going over 18 metres in height. That that accommodation, if it is within six metres, should be 30 minute fire resistance and any uh, insulation should be A1 or A2 uh, category. In terms of temporary accommodation, so temporary accommodation within the building under construction should be a 30 minute fire resistance. And yes, deep fat fryers are strictly prohibited. That's the wording within the JCOP. Um, so that's a must. Um, and it is, it, it is, um, you know, it is pretty, pretty clear cut what the, the JCOP's saying. Um, don't shoot the messenger. Hot works, perhaps the other major area of controversy. Um, but we'd go back to the hierarchy of control. Do you need to carry out hot works? Can you do cold cutting with the increase in modular construction and modern methods of construction? Can we reduce the level of hot works on site? So we keep pushing that message. And then when you come down the hierarchy, have you got people who are trained? Have you got formalized permits to work? Um, have you got the enhanced shielding uh, and protective measures? Removal of combustibles has always been in there, but this is enhancing the control at source as far as possible. But no, we all focus on the fire watch requirements. Um, when the hierarchy of control fails and we have the fire watch, um, in the original JCOP, certainly it's been around for several years, it was 30 minutes continuous fire watch, followed by one hour intermittent, and the standard is around every 20 minutes, uh, a, 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 an intermittent inspection and fire watch of the area. That's now changed and has been pushed back to 60 minutes permanent plus 60 minutes intermittent, or longer if fire risk assessment determines that. So that is a higher standard than, than Ray talked about in the US. The standard is one plus one, um, and that's that. Yeah, and that actually aligns with 168, which talks about two hours fire watch, uh, which is, you know, which is helpful, if you like. The JCOP also talks about use of photographs and thermal Im imaging to enhance your hot works processes um, and, and fire watch processes, etc. Other main changes, assuming familiarity with the ninth edition, um, obviously with uh, the impact of Grenfell and the uh, and, and the cladding uh, and the cladding removal um, contracts and, uh, on on a scale that we've never seen before. Then obviously, by definition, you're removing combustible materials. So the JCOP talks about the need to get those materials off site um, uh, as, as quickly as possible, or if not, to be, then be safely stored so they don't increase the fire loading on the actual construction site itself during refurbishment etc. Electric vehicles 
Again, Matt and Andy um, talked about uh, lithium-ion batteries. And again, this is one that's, that's pretty, pretty raging debate at the moment. Um, so the storage of lithium-ion vehicles is prohibited within the construction site, within the building under construction. So again, we're talking about MUPES, um, but don't confuse lithium-ion batteries with lithium metal batteries and certainly not with lead acid batteries. Lithium ion batteries are the specific one that we have most concerns about. Lithium metal batteries have their own risks but they're not as enhanced as lithium ion batteries. Um, but the JCOP talks about lithium ion battery vehicles not being stored within the, the building under construction. And it talks about vehicle charging points being a minimum of 10 metres from any building under construction uh, or any combustible storage. That comes with its challenges. We appreciate that as well. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's not a must. I think that might be a should or shall. So there might be a degree of flex there around reasonable practicability. Um, and then with the introduction and the enhancement of, um, combust of combustible roof systems um, and, and, and um, cassette type roof systems, etc., if they are combustible, then again, limiting storage on site so as to reduce the fire loading. So watching out for those modern methods of construction, enhancing the fire risk, etc. So they're the main 13 generic changes that I thought you might be interested in and might be the ones you wanted me to talk about. Um, they're certainly not the ones I wanted to talk about, but you know, never, never fearful of, of taking on a challenge. They're the ones that are causing the most, the most challenge for us all. And I do say us all, we're in this together. Um, then in terms of high rise, because that's what uh, we're here to talk around. Um, so the, the JCOP defines high rise. And actually in its definition, it doesn't talk about 18 metres. Um, it talks about where an assessment undertaken by a competent person identifies that the workforce is at risk due to the height of the building under construction and the associated complexity of means of escape. So it's basically saying your risk assessment, you risk assess to define whether it's a high rise construction or not. The risks associated with the nature of the construction and the project progress should be considered alongside the likely response from the fire and rescue service in terms of timeliness and available appliances. So again, it's saying when defining your high rise, you've got to take into account the availability um, and, and of of the firefighting provision, external firefighting provision. So what are the three main changes around high-rise construction? Horizontal compartmentation, real, real um, controversial one there. However, it is qualified by the beloved, if any of you know health and safety law, by the beloved reasonable practicability. Reasonable practicability set of scales, risk on one side, cost in terms of time, trouble and money on the other. So you are allowed to risk assess and come up with that reasonable practicability. But it does ask um, that the building should be horizontally uh, fire compartmentalised at least every five floors. This is in high rise. Previous JCOP from seven years ago talked about every five floors, sorry, every ten floors. So the current JCOP has now reduced that to every five floors. That's a challenge, um, that it should be done at the earliest practicable opportunity um, and should be fire uh, compartmentalised with 60 minute temporary fire stopping until the permanent stopping is installed. So it's applying permanent standards to a building under construction, which is a challenge and we recognise that. All holes, shafts, openings to be closed off including service risers, lift shafts and stairwells. So again, these standards were there, but it was every 10 floors for high rise. Now it's every five floors. Automatic fire detection implemented on a risk-based approach. So again, risk assessed based, reasonable practicability. Focus on high fire load areas. So that makes sense. So where you've got high fire load areas, giving priority to the automatic fire detection. Use of multi-sensor detectors, so that we can look at different types of fire. Uh, and again, operational until the permanent installation is commissioned and live. But then don't forget any impairment requirements if you've got partial occupation. 
similar to you would with a, 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 an operational um, uh, insurance policy. All buildings 18 metres or above, this is in terms of firefighting, um, provision of firefighting shaft with rising main and for 50 metres plus, the buildings over 50 metres, wet riser with duplicate pumps. It's a challenge, we appreciate it's a challenge. Rising main facilities to be provided as construction progresses and accessible. So there's a theme here, and that's ensuring that the standards are in place as soon as possible as the building is, is being constructed and until um, the permanent solutions are in place. So they're the main changes. I think, I think my overarching mes message is don't run away from this, don't hide from this, take it face on, Consult with your insurers, negotiate, collaborate, get them on side. Just as you would maybe think about that with HSE. You know, don't see the insurers as somebody to be afraid of. You know, they, they will come and talk and they will, they'd much rather engage with you on a proactive basis than, than having those horrible discussions once the fire's happened or once the surveyors come to site and found some <coughs> fairly significant breaches, etc. So that's maybe the overarching mes message. And that's it. Thank you. Science and adding Book your tickets now for the 8th International Tall Building High Rise Fire Safety Conference taking place alongside FDIC in Indianapolis, US, on the 15th to the 17th of April, 2024. Three days of world-class speaker presentations, debates and networking. Book your tickets via the website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com. Early bird discount tickets will be available. The Tall and High Rise Building Fire Safety Management course is ideal for anyone who has responsibility for fire safety management in tall and high rise buildings. It is a five day intensive course with world class instructors. You can get full details of the course on our website www.tallbuildingfiresafety.com.